general pattern is that after a major extinction, there's a kind of vacuum, an ecological vacuum in the, in the Earth, which is then filled by new evolutionary radiation, a new flowering of types. So, for example, before the dinosaurs went extinct, we had the dinosaurs filling all the major trades of life. There were carnivores and herbivores, large, medium and small of both kinds. There were swimming animals, there were flying animals, there were burrowing animals, there were tree-climbing animals. They all went extinct. And then, in a rather short time, the mammals took their place and they filled each of these separate trades, the carnivores, the herbivores, the large carnivores, medium and small, large herbivores, medium and small herbivores, the tree climbers, the burrowers, the flyers, the swimmers, and so on. So if you come back 20 million years after a major extinction, what you find is it's as though the same play is being performed on the stage, only the actors have changed. extinction for over 65 million years. Without dinosaurs, without cataclysms, and due to milder climate conditions, the diversity of species has become what it is today. The human species developed during the last part of this long journey. Its appearance dates back about 100,000 years, a very small moment in time compared to the long history of the Earth. The condition for new species have not prevented human beings from dominating. There are barely any places left to conquer or natural paradises in which man has not left his mark. Modification of natural habitats is not a modern invention, but a normal practice since human beings took their first step on Earth. Anthropological research is shattering the myth of the good savage spread by some 18th century philosophers. They defended man, asserting that he was naturally good, and contending that civilization made him a greedy and selfish being, distancing him from the natural environment with which he should have remained in close contact. But humans in perfect communion with the environment are an isolated case more than a natural state. Most primitive communities have altered the ecological balance, even if they were unaware of the damage that they were causing nature. And even more important than the sacred vision of the forests and the animals, is the need to obtain immediate resources for subsistence, which has always prevailed. When the first men reached America, for example, an enormous wave of extinctions of the larger species took place. These animals were more appetizing, easier to hunt, and provided the most proteins. Thus, once man arrived, in a few hundred years, about 1,000 years, a large number of species became extinct especially the large mammals of North America and South America. This has also occurred in New Zealand and Madagascar, although mankind arrived much more recently. This happened 60 million years ago, when man landed on Australia. The human species, 
just like any other, tries to claim the most space possible for itself. But compared to other animals or plants, human beings have not been as restricted in their expansion. The possibilities to adapt to different climates and their creative abilities have allowed the human species to dominate other predators, win many battles against deathly diseases, and develop broad technology for exploiting natural resources. The population has been able to grow with barely any external limitations. In 1999, there were six billion human beings. In 2025, there will be about eight billion inhabitants. While the Earth remains the same size, the needs for space, energy, and food for human beings increases at the same fast pace as the population grows. Biodiversity suffers from the demands of the dominant species, which is now destroying natural habitats on a scale equal to its population and its technological capacity. For urban and agricultural purposes, or simply for exploiting the wealth of the region, all kinds of ecosystems are being stripped. The forest habitats are the most notable example. Every day, and all around the world, approximately one and a half million trees are felled. Barely half of them are replaced, and when they are, the hundred-year-old trees are substituted by very young ones, which are not capable of carrying out the same functions. The forest is the most varied, complex, and qualified scope of land for providing basic elements. It is the most nourishing and where the most living species nourish. Without a doubt, it is the home to the largest number of species. More than half of all species on the planet live in the forest. And at least 70% of the vital multiplicity of the planet is aided by it. But above all, and at this time, the forest is considered more than ever to be the great solution. One of the great disasters of our world is the loss of soil. The forest creates soil and maintains it. And the forest right now could also be the best therapy for climate change because they even act like a fixer. Not only for CO2, which we already know, but the forests fix noise pollution, they fix water pollution, and they fix soil pollution. Trees have also invented isolating control and reduction systems for the strongest contaminants, including the most aggressive heavy metals like mercury, lead, and cadmium. Right now, there isn't anything wiser than having the maximum number of trees in the world because what they are doing is creating good living conditions. They are creating raw materials and they are curing the worst environmental diseases. The habitats in their species do not only suffer from a direct attack, but also suffer the devastating effects on worldwide acts of contamination. The coral reefs are one of these victims. The reefs are the most exquisite creations of nature. Aside from their amazing beauty, they are capable of organizing life at the sea bottom since more than one-fourth of all aquatic species depend on coral to survive. For human beings, they are considered enormous factories for medicines like AZT, which is used to counteract AIDS. Coral has existed for 500 million years. In such a short time, however, they are disappearing. The rise in temperatures due to the greenhouse effect, the pollution of the oceans and seas, and overfishing are placing the wide expanses of reef up against the ropes in the Indian and Pacific Ocean as well as the Caribbean Sea. Today they are disappearing at such speed that maybe in less than 50 years there might not be a trace of them left. The two big ones are the need to stabilize population and stabilize climate. Uh, if we can succeed with those two then many of the other problems will take care of themselves. Um, but if we don't succeed at those, then we, we, we may fail in many of the other efforts. Um, for example, if we cannot stabilize population and if we cannot stabilize climate, 
There is not an ecosystem on Earth we can save. Everything will change. We can set land aside and call them parks or wildlife reserves and build fences around them, but if climate changes, the ecosystem will change. Um, so there's, there's a long list of, uh, of, of stresses that are developing in the relationship between the global economy and the Earth's ecosystem. They include desertification, deforestation, overgrazing, overplowing, soil erosion, rising CO2 levels, um, rising temperature, uh, more destructive storms, uh, falling water tables, uh, rivers running dry, um, uh, disappearing species, dying coral reefs, 